let's begin. I should introduce myself. My name's David Cottrell. I'm a business development consultant for Solitude Lake Management in the Northeast Florida region. I've been in the business for 26 years, starting right out of college. Went to the University of Florida, got a degree in botany, and ironically went into a field where I spend the vast majority of my time trying to figure out how to control aquatic weeds and growth. So kind of doing the opposite of what I was trained in, but it's been rewarding. And of course, a lot of benefits, you know, we're trying to keep invasives out of ponds, trying to encourage good growth. So we're not out there just trying to eradicate everything. Started in the field, just like uh, so many of us did. Worked as a technician, taking care of lakes, and probably similar to one that you're taking care of yourself. Did that for a while, worked in sales for quite a while, sort of took a natural progression on to management and sales in the Northeast Florida area for a privately owned lake management company. Uh, later expanded that into kind of a regional, regional role. And ultimately, now that I'm coming up on 26 years, I've moved into consulting. So taking all that knowledge I gathered throughout the years and trying to bring it in to help folks find solutions to their problems. So this is uh, certainly one of the more fun roles I've been in throughout the years. We have a great webinar planned. So we're gonna talk about the three lake management strategies that won't bust your budget. So let's get started. Let's begin by reviewing today's agenda. We're gonna talk about lake and pond management expenses. We're gonna break those into three categories. We're gonna break them between major expenses. We're gonna talk about reactive expenses and we're gonna talk about proactive expenses. So three categories for your budget. We're also gonna talk about some common management challenges that we run into out there. Some of the things that we've seen, things that I've seen over my 25 years in the, in the industry, common things that come up time and time again. We'll review those. We're gonna talk about why you should invest in your water body. Why not just let it go? Why not just ignore it? It looks great, right? Why do anything to it at all? Just enjoy it. Well, let's talk about why that might not be a great idea. Let's talk about what goes in the lake management costs. So maybe some of the things you haven't thought about, a little peek behind the curtain in the industry, what does it cost to really maintain these lakes? And then we're also gonna talk about three strategies that are gonna tie into our major proactive um, and reactive expenses we're gonna talk about ways to budget for those uh, strategies that'll keep your budget from getting broken. And then finally, we'll finish it up on a note of why an annual management plan is the best. Why would we recommend that you consider annual management? Before we dive in, let's talk about one of your most surprising car expenses. We can also talk about this in terms of houses. I think those are both great analogies. But think about some surprise automobile expense you've had throughout the as I stopped and thought about this, I remember a car I had years ago that had a transmission go bad, and that was an extremely expensive repair. In fact, to this day, whenever I drive my vehicle, if it shifts weird, you know, you get a weird clunker, I still kind of freak out every time thinking about, oh my gosh, this could be a fortune. So think about some of those expenses. Maybe you've had to have an AC repair on your car or your house. Uh, maybe you need a new set of tires, maybe an alternator, all these different expenses that you might run into on your car. And think about somebody you know that has a car that's 20 and 30 years old, right? You used to think, man, a car's 20 years old, you can't do anything with it. It's uh, time to get rid of it, time to replace it. But you see all kinds of folks that keep those cars going 20, 30, 40 years, and they're just as good as the day when they bought them. And that's uh, primarily due to proper care and maintenance along the way. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because I think there's a strong analogy between automobiles or homes and expenses and the way you budget for these things and lakes and ponds. Very similar type of thinking. Let's move on. Let's talk about first major expenses. That's right. These are the these are the big heavy hitters. Hopefully things that you do very infrequently. These can be things like we've pictured here. You see a tractor digging out some muck and silt and accumulation in a pond. That pond's been dewatered. You see the water's been drained. So this is a very big, complex, expensive operation. Once you dig that soil out, you got to deal with that soil. You know, you haul it off to a special landfill somewhere. You have to pile it up on site somewhere. You're going to be dealing with the odors from all the muck and the rest. Very expensive. You can only imagine. These projects can really be in the tens of thousands, if you're lucky, the hundreds of thousands of dollars big, complex, expensive problems. And then you see another picture here of lake edge restoration. 
this is repairing erosion along the perimeter of a pond where weathering and different effects have taken taken effect and folks are going in now restoring that trying to reclaim that land they've been losing the edge of their lake and now not only are they going to reclaim that land but they're also putting in something to protect against future erosion but these can also be you know big ticket items these are uh, these are kind of analogous to that transmission repair we're talking about or maybe you need a whole new ac right new roof on your house these are those big heavy hitters that are very hard to budget for right because they're so big and they require maybe an emergency fund you know in the case of a personal uh, residence or that type of thing or if you're in a community uh, reserve funding so these are those big rare things um, I was thinking about earlier, another good example of maybe these and something that's very addressable in other ways are outlets, inlets, outlets, different structures around your pond, making sure those things are, uh, you know, there's not erosion around those, there's not damage to them because bad. if you have an outfall structure that goes bad, that can be a very large ticket item to get repaired. So these are major expenses. That's our first category of expense. Let's take a take a little pause here and kind of talk about what um, you know, what challenges ponds face. Uh, most of the ponds we deal with, and probably you do as well, are man-made. Most uh, not a lot of what we see, especially in, in my part of the world, are naturally occurring ponds. If you're lucky enough to have one of those, that's great. But most of what we're dealing with are stormwater runoff ponds systems that are introduced for a variety of reasons. You know they. They control stormwater runoff is first and foremost. Something to take that stormwater that's hitting all our impervious surfaces, whether it be our driveways, our roofs, our streets, gives that water somewhere to go immediately because we can't have that water all going off to natural areas all at once, all over the place. It would create lots of flooding for everybody downstream, a lot of major issues. So kind of one of their, their first functions is to catch that stormwater, contain it, control it, but also, uh, with that comes some problems, right? Because in that water, it's going to be full of pollutants. Now, some of the pollutants are going to be nutrients, so nitrogen, phosphorus, those type of things. Other pollutants are going to be, be metals, uh, oils, different things that drip out of your car, all of the above. So that all those go into your pond kind of by design. It's a secondary function of the pond is to help keep pollution on that property where it was created. So it's a settling pond. A lot of times you'll hear these things called retention basin, whatever. Now, when you get all these different nutrients and oils and different things in the pond, that can spur, maybe not the oil so much, but the nutrients mainly can spur weed growth. So you might see a lot of weeds and here in the middle picture, you know, it's covered with weeds. That's not uncommon at all if you don't mean to do any maintenance. Algae, it's going to fuel algae and then you know, in severe cases, maybe it's going to fuel the wrong kind of algae. So you might get some toxic algaes, the cyanobacteria is also known as blue greens. This type of thing can develop over time thanks to those nutrients that are washing in. Some of the other challenges that you might face might be erosion, like we alluded to just a second ago. You see a shoreline here where there's been a lot of erosion. So that's causing a couple problems. You know, all that eroded soil, where'd it go? That's in the pond. So now, not only do we have an eroded shoreline, but we got a lake that's filled in and maybe it's gonna need dredging. So shoreline erosion can be a major issue. Very important that you address it early in, in the uh, conversation because it can lead to these other problems. Property loss, you know, things can fall in, right? It's too bad your house might go in. So erosion can be an issue. And then lastly, another challenge is this muck development. So that's filling in. Like we talked about before, it ties back to that major expense of the dredging we talked about or excavation, you get muck that accumulates over the years. So that gets in there a couple ways. One, any of the vegetation that grows in there. So if we get an overabundance of vegetation, as a vegetation dies and decomposes and falls and sinks to the bottom, it stacks up as organic material. So that's some of the muck. And also leaves and different things that blow in uh, can really lead to a lot of muck. So really wanna encourage best management practices out there. Don't blow your grass clippings into the lake. You know, if you got leaves going into storm drains, if you can catch catch those with catch basins or something, that's a great best management practice to keep all this from going into your lake and causing that muck development. And uh, you know, it's a myth that these community uh, these water bodies are self-regulating. They're just not right. These are man-made man-made ponds, and we've got all these influences that we just talked about hitting them. So there's a lot of a lot of influence going into these ponds that are causing problems. 
expenses. With that, let's move on. We'll talk about the second major you know, expense category, and that is the reactive care. What, do, uh, what are we reacting to? This can be similar to the automobile analogy where you get a tire blowout, perhaps, right? You're going to have to react to that. You're going to have to change the tire. You're going to have to go to the tire store and get a new tire, maybe a whole new set. <laughs> if you're unlucky, that might swing, swing over into the uh, major category if that happens. Maybe, you know, another analogy uh, might be a uh, break job, something like that. You know, it's kind of these middle of the road, unexpected, like, oh, man, I made it four years on these breaks and now I wasn't really thinking about it. Now my brakes are squealing and I got to react and do something about it. So these are reactive things. And in the world of pond management, uh, probably the most common one by and large is exactly what you see pictured here. These ponds have blown up with algae and other aquatic weeds on the surface of the pond that there's somebody out treating the lakes with EPA, you know, registered aquatic herbicides, trying to bring these things under control, trying to react to them. Folks are mad, their lake looks bad out there cleaning them up so this is the type of thing where it's a short-lived solution you know maybe maybe we're going to treat it now maybe that's going to last two or three months get you by a couple months and maybe you'll be right back there doing the same thing again and you're letting letting it dictate when and how much of this you're going to do right instead of you dictating these can be uh these can be more difficult to budget for because you just don't know like how much you're going to have to react to these things we're working with a client in this area right now where we cleaned the entire lake up, several acres of lake. It was completely covered with a plant known as salvinia, a little floating weed. So we um, you know, went in and designed a plan to treat those, got the lake cleaned up. And the question is, you know, is this, is this gonna carry on through the next year or are they gonna get a couple years out of it or are they gonna get three months out of it? You just, you know, you just don't know. It's, it's a reactive approach to it. So these are a little tougher to budget for. You know, you gotta have a little bit of emergency fund for these as well. And, uh, you know, these, this type of thing is often very seasonal, so uh, probably get through the winter, probably be all right in the case, in the example I'm talking about. But, you know, it's just kind of the, you don't know, it's kind of the one you're always in fear of, right? Like, oh gosh, hope this, hope that doesn't happen. So let's move on, we'll talk about the third approach, and that's the proactive or the routine maintenance. This is the, this is the ongoing approach. Um, this is where you know the costs, you're not getting surprised. You're not relying on that emergency fund. <clears throat> this is in your budget every month. You know, it's the cable or whatever internet uh, TV you have now. So this has set costs. There's no surprises. Um, these are often more cost effective over time as well. Uh, we was working with a client recently on one of these type projects where we had proposed uh, they wanted algae control. Now let's clean up the algae. Let's follow it up a month later just to make sure we got it all. And the uh, question was, if this is May, June, how long does that get us? Is that going to get us through till next year? Well, we weren't really sure. You know, we're thinking, well, probably going to re be revisiting this algae September, October, if we do this approach. And when you compared the cost of that, uh, annual management actually came out less. So, um, you know, you got ongoing experts, you got that monitoring occurring out there every month. So ultimately, the client, you know, they weighed their pluses and minuses of that and ultimately went on an annual plan. So this, you know, this is a much more proactive approach where people are watching, watching the read the tea leaves, seeing what's going on. Okay, so let's move on. We'll talk about planning for lake management expenses now. Okay, how do you how do you plan? So let's start by uh, talking about why we would invest in your lake. A lot of reasons. And uh, I know we got a variety of folks here on the call. So you might be investing in your lake for, for a variety of different reasons, but if you're a community manager, for instance, you're probably hoping to have happier residents, right? Ponds are certainly a point of pride for folks. They, they love them. Whenever a developer comes in and designs a community, you know, what do they do with the lots on the water, right? They're more money because people want to be on the water. They love the water. They enjoy the water and the serenity it brings. You know, there's just, just something about water that people love. So. That's the uh, first thing, you know, point of pride. It's beauty, it gives you something to look at. Sit on your lanai, enjoy a cocktail at the end of the day. You know, what, what could be better? So uh, there are also a lot of recreational opportunities with a pond. You think about it, you know, if you like to fish, that's great. Maybe you don't care about fishing, but your kids come, your grandkids come and they want to fish in it. That can be a real thrill. Take them down, you know, just walk right down in the back of your yard, catch a brim, a bass, have some fun with, with that. And also it increases property values. We talked about developers, but also, you know, for resale. So if the pond looks good, then uh, that makes it a much easier sell. We 
have many times gotten calls over the years from panicky real estate agents that say, oh my gosh, the pond looks terrible. Got a showing. I can't believe it. I'm not going to be able to sell this house because of the way the pond looks. You know, it's, a, it, it's real. So, um, and you know, it does, it does make an impression. I get it. If somebody sees a poor looking pond, they're probably going to say, you know, I, they probably treat the whole community this way. Like, can I trust that the common grounds are maintained well? Can I trust that the playgrounds are maintained well? So there's just kind of an overall, you know, aesthetic that's important for the pond. So, you know, you'll have happier residents. Also, you should invest in your lake because of the function they provide. You think about it in terms of flood prevention, which we touched on a minute ago. These ponds, they catch that water. And there's two things. One, if that water doesn't have somewhere to be stored, which these ponds are designed and engineered to do, it can cause a tremendous amount of flooding, not only on the property, maybe downstream. So like I said, they, they're engineered to take on X gallons of water for a rain event of X many inches and you know, such amount of time. There's a lot, a lot more that goes into them. They don't just dig a hole and say, all right, well, we've created a, we've created a pond. It's got to have a certain amount of water. It holds all the time. That allows for nutrients to settle out. That's their other function. So keep that water, let nut uh, nutrients and pollutants settle out and also take on storm water every time it rains. So very important functions. And also they have maybe have regulatory functions. Maybe it allows those dissolved solids to settle out in the pond so you're not discharging water that's out of compliance. Um, so there's compliance issues there. Also, there's, uh, you know, for property managers, I know there's a bunch on the call. It can, uh, you know, it can help make you look like, uh, you know, a, a trusted advisor and for board members, the same thing. You know, is our board really looking out for our best interests, taking care of our property, doing doing the right things, making sure that this community is the best it can be. So all those are a lot of good reasons you should consider investing in your lake. Moving on, we'll talk about some of the costs that go into lake management. Maybe some of the things you haven't thought about. It's like, darn, do I really want to spend the money? Is it worth the money? Well, hopefully we can make a case that, you know, it's uh, there's costs that go into this and it's money worth spending. So first and foremost, one of the things that's most important is to have people that are well-trained and spend their time and energy and money becoming more and better trained. So is the lake manager, you know, they need to acquire licenses, they need to attend lots of training, you know, going to symposiums, learning about the latest and greatest technologies out there so they can share that with you and implement that on your lake, uh, participate in certification courses. So first of all, labor, and of course, we know like everything else, labor is, you know, usually one of the most expensive drivers of any industry. So labor costs, big part of what goes into lake management. Uh, lake management products aren't cheap. The products we use to control the weeds are very expensive, they're very specialty, and they're very expensive for one reason because they're very hard to get past the EPA. EPA places very stringent guidelines on products before they'll approve them for use in aquatic environments, which is good, that's what we want, but it also means that the companies spend a lot of money to get that approved, and also it means there's a very limited number of products or manufacturers that can make them. So product costs are probably, uh, you know, probably more significant than they should be. So, you know, analogy there is the, it's the medicine that, uh, it's the name brand medicine, right? You're, you're kind of stuck with that sometimes. So products are expensive. And also there's a lot of weird specialty tools. Like if you look at our picture here, we got a, we got one of our biologists there with a water sampler, special water sampler, you know, something like that's custom made, very expensive. Also, you'll see some tools and equipment here, like a on the water harvester, very, very expensive. You know, that thing's got to float and harvest. It's a tractor that floats. So very expensive, very specialty piece of equipment there. And then, uh, then I asked for kind of a picture. Uh, I like this one because it's obviously not a very expensive piece of equipment, but the point being just that it takes special equipment. So, you know, somebody had to throw that on top of a truck, strap it down, bring a trolling motor and a battery. So, you know, very special specialized equipment. And of course, we have all the others that every other business has. You have gas, you have insurance, you have vehicles, you have maintenance. So a lot, a lot of expenses that go into managing ponds. So now that you know about that, let's talk about finding the right partner for your community. So I think this first one is by far the most important. You want somebody who's going to work with you to customize a plan for your lake. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Not at all. You know, if 
you can't just shoot a proposal out the door and say, hey, here's here's our basic management plan. Let us know if you're interested. You really need to you really need to make a decision. And I think the place to start is what are your goals for your lake? Because different goals can have very different strategies for your lake and very different outcomes for your lake. You know, most people I've talked to, my experience is, yeah, I want a lake that has tons of fish, water's crystal clear, and has no algae, you know, all this stuff. And one of the first conversations I'll have every time is, well, you know, a few of these things are button heads with each other. You really can't have a productive fishery if you don't have the primary producers. In other words, you know, like the algae and the planktons and different things that feed the base of the food chain. So if your goals have crystal clear water and a great fishery, that may not be, may not be achievable. Or if your goal is, you know, you just want it to look good, then, you know, management plan where you're doing maintenance and control, then that might be the plan. And then if water quality is the most important thing to you, like you want the lowest nutrient levels and the lowest amount of sediment and soil and dissolved solids in the pond, then that's a different program. So first you want to work one-on-one -on -one with somebody who's willing to, you know, willing and able, that's the other thing, is the partner capable of doing various, various things um, to customize a plan for you. So. Uh, that's probably one of the strongest, most important points I'd want to make. Science base is very important. You really want to use not just the method of riding up looking and going, okay, this is, you know, lick your finger, stick it in the air. Hey, this is what I think, think you need. No, you want a little more of a science based approach than that. You want to do, you know, if you're using an analogy of going to the doctor, <clears throat> you want to do lab testing. You want to get the blood work. You want to see what your cholesterol is. Same thing on a pond. We'll talk more about that. But if you, know, you really want science-based approach where you do, do some measurements, whether it be uh, water quality or mapping, or uh, you know, where bathymetry comes up here in the slide, that's just a mapping, bottom mapping of a pond. So those are uh, good informed uh, data points and uh, strongly recommend that. And, you know, a good partner is also going to be mindful of your budget, right? They're not going to take advantage if they think you got a high budget. They're going to give you their real recommendation, but, uh, but mindful. If there's alternatives, you know, which alternative best meets your goal, but also best falls in line with your budget or, you know, help you not be penny wise and pound foolish, right? Like, now let's do something cheap here, but knows that that's going to cost you a lot more later on. So with those, I think um, with those, I think you'd find yourself a good partner for your lake management. Okay, so let's move on. We'll uh, slide into uh, three strategies to keep your budget afloat. All right, so first, we're gonna refer back to these major services. This was, as we talked about before, and like the dredging, you can see here again, uh, there's, a, there's a dredge. Also, another piece of equipment here, this is a hydro rake, the bottom picture, where that's actually a floating platform that has a grabber that can reach in and dig out sediments off the bottom or clean out vegetation, either one. So. These, uh, you know, these major services, these are important because they can prevent flooding. For instance, like we talked about, maybe your pond no longer holds the capacity that it used to. Maybe there's not enough water storage capacity in there to properly treat the water to get the nutrients to settle out. So it's no longer working the way it was designed and really permitted. So maybe you're going in, you're having to try to reestablish that. Hopefully these projects are ones you either, you know, never have to do or it's on a very long long time frame. Because like I said, these, these projects can be expensive. I had a client years ago who told me I didn't work on this project. But they told me they redid a small pond and it was like a it's like six hundred thousand dollar project. I just couldn't believe it. Uh, so you know you really want to anything you can do to avoid getting to this stage is is good. And uh, this a lot of what causes these problems we talked about, you know, leaves falling in, uh, grass clip, clippings going into lake, all those kinds of things. Uh, We'll also talk a little more about uh, oxygen and how it can contribute contribute to these things. Another major service as we move on is uh, erosion. We touched on that a little bit earlier. Here's a great series of pictures where you can see uh, shoreline restoration. I love the first one, the upper left picture. <clears throat> that's a uh, that's a home where somebody obviously they're concerned, right? It looks like the erosion's approaching their house, and you see all the broken concrete and rubble and different things there. And, that they did what any of us would do. First thing's like, let's throw some riprap rubble down there and stop this. And obviously you can see even where there's erosion occurring around, there's big hunks of concrete, different chunks. So ultimately it looks, uh, in this case, it looks like they did a shoreline restoration with a bioengineered system there. You can see kind of the during where the, the uh, materials there. And then at the end, 
bottom picture just shows the finished product. It looks like nothing ever happened. You know, better than that, it looks um, that grass looks better than it did in the first one. So, you know, these are significant. These are significant upfront costs. Uh, fortunately, these projects usually have long-lasting results, but they are major. So you do want to prepare. You do want to have reserves for these things. You do want to do assessments. Maybe identify, you know, it's great. If you can identify the little erosion and address it early on, that can really save you a lot down the road. Because once, the more eroded it is, the more difficult it is to repair. And as we talked about, all that soil, it's in the lake now, right? So you don't want to get to that phase. Okay, let's move on. We'll talk about some of the reactive services. All right, most common one, this is the, this is probably number one. <clears throat> the invasive weed algae, toxic algae management. This is uh, the bulk of what reactive is. They're unexpected, but these can be preventable is the thing. So uh, in this case, you know, see a toxic algae, what looks like maybe like a toxic algae bloom there. Uh, so it's gonna be eliminated using pesticide, maybe maybe a shrink case you gotta do physical removal on vegetation. You gotta get it back. And that can be that can be somewhat expensive. So why do you need to do it? You know, you got to prevent the impact, the environmental impact. Uh, also, you got to get that system functioning properly, as we talked about before. So, you want to correct any imbalances. You want to you want to prevent muck that would result from this. So, uh, you got you got all these issues and frequency, like we talked about. This is you know hopefully maybe a seasonal thing, um, but you know, it could occur more often. It might be something that you're looking to do on a more uh, more proactive plan. Talking about proactive plans, these are uh, these are ones that we can pre-plan for. We know the expenses are upfront. We can budget for them a lot easier, like we talked about. So some good ones here. I always recommend water testing. I think water testing is just one of the best things you can possibly do for your lake. It informs you know it informs management strategies, and most importantly, I think it gives you a great bottom a baseline. Uh, Talk to people over the years you know one thing you'll hear from people is like oh this lake's just getting worse and worse it's can't believe it's going downhill it's terrible you know don't we don't have fish anymore the water quality is awful and uh, it's all anecdotal there's just it's an opinion because there's no quantifiable data out there to say this is what we were and here's where we are we're just you know going off the way we feel maybe we're having a bad day we're just feeling bad about the pond so water quality testing where you can if you haven't done it before you can establish a baseline is great you can figure out what are your phosphorus levels, what are your nitrogen levels, and two years from now, maybe you compare it again and say, all right, are they worse or better? You know, are they the same? Are we holding steady state? So it's it's good to have these numbers locked in for one, but also it's good because this informs future strategies about how you're going to maintain that lake, how can you improve the water quality. Some of the most important things to test for, and I think number one on that list, dissolved oxygen, critically important to test for dissolved oxygen. And um, I don't just mean at the surface, like so many people do, or there's these little test kits and you look at the surface because surface water is going to have good oxygen in most cases. <clears throat> we want to know what the oxygen is at the bottom of the lake, you know, from top to bottom, what does it look like? So that requires a probe where you get out there on a boat and you do some real measurements. pH is a good thing to know. It's, you know, if you're concerned about your fishery, you definitely want to know about your pH. Uh, we talked about the nutrients that because they fuel algae and other growth, so we want that. Maybe algae identification if you're having a difficult to control algae or you're concerned you have a toxic algae in there can be very important. Uh, also, turbidity if the water needs to meet certain standards. Like if you have a permit regulation that requires you don't discharge water over certain turbidity, which turbidity is just you know, floating matter in the pond basically for is it is the water muddy, you know, like muddy water is turbid water. Uh, also, ammonia, you know, is the water safe uh, for fisheries. So. Uh, a lot of good reasons to do that, and then frequency—that's a common question. Uh, you know that that can be that can be guided by what your goals for the pond are, but I'd say at a minimum once a year is a great frequency where you kind of see how things are going. But quarterly may be in order uh, as well. So now you know how often it just kind of depends on on the specifics. That's why you want that trusted consultant that you're working with. Talk about another proactive approach. So we talked about the testing, but that can lead into maybe nutrient management. If we did that testing and we found out that your phosphorus was sky high, then you might say, all right, 
let's take a proactive approach and reduce your phosphorus. And here's a you know, here's a few pictures of products being applied. They're binding agents. So you'll hear this referred to a lot as nutrient abatement ways to lock down that phosphorus. And there's a lot of products that can do that. There's products that are based um, with aluminum. There's products based with another rare earth element, the lanthanum, that'll actually physically bind phosphorus and sink it to the bottom. And that can become integrated into the bottom sediments, into the bottom soils, and unavailable for algae and other plants to grow. Uh, it's a great approach, great approach. Um, I didn't mention it before, but there's also kind of an interplay between phosphorus and nitrogen levels. There's a ratio <clears throat> where you really want to kind of have it in a sweet spot so that you promote the right kind of algae and don't promote the wrong kind of algae. So this is this is a way to manipulate that ratio. We can control the phosphorus. We can well, we can bring the phosphorus down and get that ratio maybe back in line if that's if that's the proper approach. So there's other products. There's polymers that can also do this. Uh, there's bacterial products, denitrifiers. So a few different things we can use to help deal with phosphorus, uh, and other uh, you know, other nutrients in the pond. Talk about another proactive approach and fountains and aeration. This is probably one of the most fun things to talk about. Everybody loves a fountain in the pond, right? So here's a, a picture of a nice fountain in the, in the middle is kind of more of a, a volcano style fountain aerator. And then in the last one, you can just barely see it, but in the middle of the lake, there's a small circle. That's bubbles coming up from a bottom diffused aeration system. A little bit about each of these and I don't know what makes sense for you. So fountains, you know, these are great. Obviously, aesthetically, they're terrific. They throw water up in the air. You can put lights on them. Now there's LED lights, color changing lights, all these different things you can do. It makes a wonderful feature. If, you know, if we talked before, if one of your goals is like aesthetics, you want to make a show, put this in the front pond as everybody drives in, they get their nuts. That's great. These are a great solution for that. So uh, as far as getting oxygen in the water, it can be, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, most fountains are built essentially like an inner tube with a submersible pump mounted directly underneath. And that'll entrain water from a few feet deep, maybe four or five feet deep, and create some circulation there. But it really probably won't address the bottom of your pond. So if your pond's eight, 10, 12 feet deep, you're probably still going to have an area at the bottom of your pond where you're not creating any influence whatsoever. So fountains can do a little of either. And most people, you know, want to want to hope their fountain's going to do it all, but certainly we'll be cautious about stating that. This little surface volcano type fountain here, that's uh, they're kind of more efficient in oxygen transfer. But there again, this is at the surface. These are designed to entrain water maybe from a little bit deeper. So maybe a good option in certain cases on a small pond that can certainly be a small shallow pond can be great. And then finally, probably uh, one of the most economical and best solutions if you're trying, if your goal is to get more oxygen at the bottom of your pond, you did the water testing, found out you were bad, you want to improve it, this is the way to go. This essentially puts a compressor up on shore, blows air to the bottom of the lake where it diffuses through a membrane, bubbles, lift the water from the bottom, from the very bottom, it sits on the bottom, gets it to the surface, oxygen diffuses in, and the process goes on and on. So these are much more economical, not only to buy up front, maintenance is much cheaper on these. Uh, you don't have electricity in the water. And just to kind of let you know what these really are if you've ever had a fish tank right little air compressor hose the stone on the bottom same thing this is just scaled up for a lake so talk to your professional about that if you think you have underlying and then how about plantings so this these beneficial buffers another word for plantings along the edge of the lake sometimes you'll hear first part of the lake called the littoral zone so that from where the grass stops or the yard stops out into the water, shallow enough to grow these plants. That's called a littoral area. And these plants are all growing on them here. In this picture, we have some pickerel weed there with the purple flower in the middle, some canna, and then looks like maybe some gulf spike rush in the last one. A lot of benefits to these beneficial buffers. All right. So first and foremost, aesthetically, I mean, look how great these look. Much more interesting than just the grass shoreline that everybody sees everywhere. So you got the flowers, pickerweed, for example, blooms. I don't know, it seems like it blooms eight months out of the year. It really blooms for a long time. Other benefits include they're going to attract a lot of wildlife. So you'll get birds and different waterfowl. It's a good place for fish. It's going to promote the fishery. It gives the, the small ones a place to hide and hang out. Um, maybe it will attract snakes. I know. I hear you out there saying that. And it probably does to some degree. So it's natural habitat. You may have some of those 
you'll get those benefits. You'll also get, and this is maybe one of the best benefits of all, these plants are gonna do a lot to slow or stop your erosion. All the, the wave action from the wind is gonna be broken up by hitting these, not reaching the shoreline where you'll have erosion. You have the roots from these plants, so actually dig into the soil, hold that first section of the toral together, which fortifies that section, so fortifies up the bank. Plants are great for that. Uh, things, you know, things to be cautioned about is, you know, there is more maintenance because it does require you get in there, keep the invasives out so that you don't have those overtake these. So maybe a little more maintenance when you have littoral plants. I think it's worth the investment. Uh, one thing I do want to touch on a lot of, you know, I think it's a bit of a misconception that you, know, you put the plants in, they take up nutrients. Oh man, they're going to solve your nutrient problems. There can be some benefit there. You know, they just got to think, especially with these kind of plants. The roots go into the soil, they mine most of the nutrients from the soil. And also, once these plants are fully grown out, they die, decompose, fall in the water, and re-release nutrients. So if that is your strategy, you need to cut and harvest the plants on a pretty regular basis to get the nutrients out of the system and then let them grow back from the roots. So it could be a good approach though. It can be a good approach. Uh, and certainly, I think aesthetically, they make a lot of sense and would certainly recommend them for that reason. And then, so now I consider this kind of the fourth proactive approach, annual maintenance. So why annual maintenance? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And we touched on, you know, a bunch of this, a bunch of this earlier, but um, talk about customized programs. You, you know, you can meet your goal where you can't really, it might be hard to meet your goal if it's something you're just going to do every now and then. Obviously, you're not, you're not going to reactively reach, a, reach most of your goals. So you can, uh, you know, you get that customized plan in there. I think the preventative piece of it's probably the best, right? Like why let it get bad and then fix it up, it looks good again. It's bad, you deal with that, you're miserable, clean it up, looks good again. You keep going through the cycle. Why not just have it looking good all the time, more of a steady state type of control. So the preventative piece of it, it's much better. We talked about it before. It's more budget friendly. You can expect to pay that same amount every month and stay in this more steady state level of control. If there's compliance issues, it might help you stay in compliance. Like we talked about the, the turbidity, different discharging of nutrients and that type of thing. <clears throat> Enhanced property values, right? Good looking lake. Everybody thinks, hey, lake's well maintained. They're maintaining the pool well. They're maintaining the common grounds well. This is a community I want to be a part of, right? So you got that uh, property value enhancement. And also, the real estate agent brings, it's time to sell your house, brings the client in. They go, this looks great. Oh my gosh, look at this beautiful pond back here. I can see myself sitting out here every day already. So you don't want the opposite where they walk out and they're like, oh my gosh, it smells and this looks, looks like a mess because they're only doing this on a reactive type of basis. Might talk about improved recreation, you know, kayak, that type of thing. You don't want to get out on a lake that's full of weeds. And in this area years ago, and it's a lake uh, I've managed many years, uh, they let the lake get completely choked out with hydrilla and some folks went out in the middle of the night in a boat, fell over and one of them drowned because they got tangled up in weeds. So, you know, there are, it's not, it wasn't recreational available, I guess was my point there. So don't let that happen. Don't let that happen to your pond. Uh, you'll have delighted residents. So look how happy these folks are. So really at the end of the day, what uh, what it does is it instills confidence. So if you're a board member, if you're a property management, the folks in your community say, hey, you know, we got people that we got managing in this community are on the ball. They got us a good, competent contractor that's helping us meet our goals, keeping our lake looking good. You know, we're just, we're just pleased as punch. So uh, it can make you, if you're in one of those roles, look good as well. And that's why I recommend you do consider going with annual maintenance. So with that, that concludes the informative part of the presentation today. We made it through the uh, entire slide deck there. So now we'll move into the question and answer session. So as we do that, uh, it's still not too late. If you need to quiet, uh, type a question in, you can use that question tab. As I uh, ask the questions, you're going to receive a poll. So please participate in that. Let us know if you're interested in a consultation and they'll be happy to help you. We have BDCs all over the country, so we'll have somebody in your area who knows your area that can help you achieve your goals in your specific place. All right, there'll also be a feedback survey at the end, and you'll also have an opportunity as part of that to request to speak to an expert. So there'll be another opportunity.
beauty there. And if you'll notice, there is a QR code available. You can grab, or you will be seeing a QR code, I should say, uh, where you can grab uh, and form a guide that puts essentially this presentation into the form of a PDF. So that PDF you can use to, uh, you know, refer back if there was anything in here. You said, oh, I want to I review that. You'll, uh, you'll have that available. So with that, let's move in and see what kind of questions we have. All right, good. Looks like we have some good ones in here. Okay, let me start. Jump right in. First one, can phosphorus and nitrogen levels be lowered? How can this be done? Yes, yes. So uh, we talked a little bit about it in the presentation, but there's a number of products out there. And like I said, first, we want to talk about going in and doing some testing first. Like, what are your levels? Uh, is it one you want to manipulate? Because there is this interplay between phosphorus and nitrogen. But if you do, and you come back and you say, hey, these are high, I want to limit this, you can apply products like the aluminum product. Um, a lot of folks call that alum, or aluminum sulfate. It's very commonly used. It's been used for decades if not a century it's used in wastewater plants to treat water it's using pulp and paper industry it's very very common well understood product but it, but it's a good binding product so it physically bonds to phosphorus and sinks it to the bottom also it can be great for turbidity so if your dissolved solids are too high in the water it forms this thing called a flock where it you know coagulates and it grabs nitrogen phosphorus organic material i mean everything sinks it to the bottom if you if you need to if you wanted a crystal clear pond, you could do a strong treatment with that. And literally, you could have water temporarily looking like a swimming pool. So very good for that. Uh, there's other products like the lanthanums, even better at binding phosphorus. Other things do too as well. It's just uh, like iron, um, calcium, they can also bond phosphorus. Thing is, their bond is much weaker, so it lets go of it too easy. So really, the aluminum and the lanthanum are best. Uh, and then, like I said, there's a polymer products and some other things. So, so yep, reach out to a consultant. They can certainly help you with that. <clears throat> oh, the next one. Oh, this is a good one. It's funny because we've talked this next one. Are there, are there fountains that can run via solar power? What are the pros and cons? Yeah, we talked about this one a lot recently uh, internally as a group. And uh, so technically sort of, um, but not really. So we just, the spoiler alert there. So if, yeah, most fountains to move water and throw it up in the air takes quite a bit of energy and it's tough uh, to generate the amount of power needed to do that with a, with a solar array unless you're going to get pretty darn big. So there's some very very small units that are able to do that with pretty much look silly in a pond basically. Um, and then there are ones that are available on a bigger scale that use a combination of solar and electric. So if you're, if the reason you want solar is because you want to use less electricity, you want, to, uh, you want to be smart about it, then this may be a good way to go. So they have this thing that's a blender, use the solar as much as it can, blends in with uh, house power, basically. So that's an option. But um, if your goal is like, hey, I can't get power there, I want a fountain, you're, you're probably not going to find anything you're going to be very satisfied with on the solar side. Um, um, <clears throat> sorry. So for Aerators, there are some options for small ponds because they are much less energy demanding. So you can do uh, solar aerators on, uh, you know, on a pretty small scale. You have to, you know, you'll be looking at a couple solar panels, but um, there's ones that run just when the sun's out, and there's ones that have battery backup. So hope, hope that helps. All right. Okay. All right. Is dredging ponds preferred during winter months? And is the pond easier to access due to the frozen ground? Wow. You know, I'm probably not the subject matter expert for that second half, being having been born and raised in Florida. Um, I wish a different BDC was on for that one. But uh, yeah, then during the winter months, you know, there's probably reasons why I would say yes to that. I'd be thinking in terms of rainfall, you know, typically the winter is going to be a drier season. So if you have to do any dewatering, then you probably have less to dewater. You're not going to be dealing with the influx of rainwater. So Certainly during the dry season, if that falls in the winter in your area, then I would say for that reason, yes, and maybe less foliage to deal with, and you're probably gonna be dealing with less stink. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so that's a, that's a good, interesting question. Other than that, I don't know, I can't think of any pros and cons off the top of my head uh, on that one. Ooh, next one, are bubblers noisy? Man, do we get that one a lot. And uh, <laughs> it is definitely in the ear of the beholder when it comes to noise. I've had 
I've seen systems in that folks have called the city about complaining <laughs> because of the noise. And I've gotten out there and thought, wow, this is just not very noisy at all. So they're, they're really not. They're probably on par for the most part with outside AC units is what I've always heard over the years. And I think that's pretty apt analogy. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty quiet. So the compressor goes into a cabinet and the cabinet has a lid that closes. And most manufacturers include sound dampening material on the inside. So they're actually, they're actually quite quiet. You know, I think you wouldn't want them right up next to a house. They do vibrate a little, the nature of the pumps for the most part. There's two versions. There's a piston version, which can have a little bit of an imbalance that creates a little bit of a vibration. And believe me, none of this is, is bad. Uh, these are pretty minor things, but uh, there's other ones that, that are more of a centrifugal spinner that are a little more smooth. But yeah, are they noisy? Uh, my answer is no, they are not noisy. Uh, but some folks seem to be bothered by them anyway. I'd certainly encourage before you buy one, go listen to one somewhere for yourself. Oh, <clears throat> what are some good solutions to mitigate and repair erosion damage? All right, that's a good question. Yeah, some mitigation we've talked about. Plants can be a really good, a really good early thing to do. We've talked about a break-in, you know, that wave action that hits and also fortifying everything. So plants, I would say, probably one of the least expensive and quickest and and very effective ways to catch it early on. If you're kind of past that point, then you got some solutions like riprap can be fun, but you gotta, with riprap, you kinda gotta go all in. Um, you can't just do a little riprap. You gotta, you gotta know what you're doing and put, put enough in. With that though, you know, there's gonna be disadvantages there. You're gonna have weeds that grow through riprap. Um, you know, kids maybe crawling all over, risking getting hurt, skin knees, rock slides fall, you know, all those kind of things. So, River app can be kind of a tough one if it's a private pond and maybe it's a perfect spot for it. And then there's there's other solutions like you saw pictured there. That's a that shoreline bioengineered system that could be like a sock system where they actually take this piece of material and uh, it gets kind of folded back over like a like a taco and then backfilled with soil and sediment off the bottom of your pond or imported fill material. And the way the, that particular product works, it recreates the shoreline and I think. You know, you probably saw how good that shoreline looked in the end. Like, you know, this looked like nothing had ever happened. It looked like the day they built the place. <clears throat> and grass can actually grow on top of it. And I've seen a lot of these over the years in person. Very, very good. Uh, they hold up well. They last decades. Um, you know, they look, they look great. There's other things called like geotubes maybe you've seen on the market. Uh, those those look great when they're done and they, they reset the shoreline well. But to date, they've had uh, longevity problems, so you know, be a little, a little leery of those things. But um, you know, bulkheads, obviously, that's like next level uh, expensive. And then a lot of times, with bulkheads, is one thing you might get into where you won't with these other solutions is that uh, the bulkhead probably has to go through an ARB if you're in a community, like an architectural review board, <laughs> because of the change, and maybe even stormwater permitting with a, if you have a water management district or somebody in charge of that type of stuff. So, you know, that can be a little more, a little more of a challenge in that regard. Whereas like the shoreline restoration where you put it back to grass, most places consider that just maintenance and it's right by the ARBs that only require permits. A lot of times, you know, can't speak for, can't speak for all of them. Okay, so let's see. When using lanthanum compounds, how frequently do you typically have to apply? Annually, semi-annually, quarterly, okay. Yeah, there again, that's a good question. There again, you really need to do the water testing and monitoring, even if it's just for phosphorus levels because that's what you're trying to target in that case. They, because the answer is gonna be different. Uh, it really depends on your inputs. So nutrients get in the ponds. So every time it rains, there's an influx, right? So maybe if you have a very dry season, then you're not really getting those inputs. Those external inputs happening at all. So you can coast through that whole as opposed to it's raining, you know, like raining every other day, like it does in Florida and you're constantly getting these inputs. All right, maybe you need to be on a monthly, like a maintenance dose, so maybe a smaller maintenance dose of a lanthanum or aluminum product or whatever you choose. Uh, but without testing to kind of quantify that, really no way to know. So that, that would kind of be my answer there. Also, we talked, I just mentioned those external loads. Also, there can be internal loading from groundwater. Nutrients can come in that way sometimes. So, you know, maybe the thing to do would be, you know, 
maybe say first year you do monthly testing. Let's check our phosphorus every month as we're as we're doing this or, or whatever it is. And then maybe you get comfortable after a time, like, okay, I see this program's working, let's just test once a year or whatever. So it's kind of a long roundabout way of saying uh, there's there's no one size fits all for that one. Um, so I'd recommend the, you know the testing couple. Right, <clears throat> next one. Oh, that's a hot topic. Can you biologically reduce and control muck that's gathered over 20 years versus dredging? So muck is a very difficult one. All right, when we think about muck, there's a couple of things to consider. So muck can be a, it's probably a combination, almost certainly a combination of or, organic component and an inorganic component. You can't have, uh, microbes biologically so what we're talking about here is bacteria products and you know, enzymes and different things that'll that'll decompose chew up chew up the muck if if your muck is made up of 50 percent organic and 50 percent inorganic the most you can hope to do is get rid of half of that right so if you have two foot of muck it's half inorganic half organic best case you get rid of all the organic and you're still so you got about half as much muck as you have there again testing believe it or not you can you can take muck, send it off to a lab. They can tell you what percentage of that is inorganic versus inorganic. So uh, so that's one way to do it. But you know the biologicals can reduce muck to some degree. Um, it's been a hot topic over the years. It's, it's a little debatable about how effective they are, how fast and effective they are. So uh, you know it's um, it can help, and I would certainly recommend it if you really want them to work. You need oxygen at the bottom of the pond for most of these though, because uh, as we get into it. <laughs> get too far in the weeds with this but if you have no oxygen at the bottom of the pond most microbes bacteria aren't going to survive or be able to <clears throat> be able to live down there they're not going to be able to breathe not going to, be able to respire and if they can't do that then they can't eat the food so um, you know aeration coupled with with the bacteria can be a good approach to help and then like i said that's somewhat limited thanks to the amount of inorganic versus inorganic all right so i hope hope that helps and uh, i hope you look at that a little Okay. Oh, yeah. That's a real common question. These are all good questions because these are all things I've gotten time and time again over the years. Uh, if you have turtles, fish, you know, other wildlife, are the chemical solutions dangerous? You know, everybody asks that. Uh, so, good question. And for the most part, if they're and you know, if they're applied properly, using label rates, there's no no problem, no problem at all. Uh, that's one of the main things the EPA looks at when they're when they're labeling these products is are they safe? So they, they have to be, for the most part, these are biodegradable in the system with the exception of maybe like copper sulfate, which is commonly used for allergy control. But the other ones, you know, biodegradable in the system, short time, time frame in the system. Um, and they have to be because unlike land, when you put something in the pond, everything's exposed to that. You spray along the edge, fish in the middle, it's gonna be exposed to some of it. Unlike on land where you can put things down and they kind of stay on their target zone. So the EPA is very, very cautious about that. So they're safe, they're safe in that regard. The only caveat to that is if applied properly. So it's much like carbon monoxide, for example, or even carbon dioxide or, or salt, any of those things. Those, those things are all around us and we're able to deal with them and it's safe and they're not causing us any harm at normal levels, you know, so at appropriate levels. So, but if you get too much of that, you get in a room that's nothing but carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, or you, you know, eat four pounds of salt, then you've, you know, you got kind of an acute issue there and they can be a problem. So if, uh, if misapplied, overapplied, then yes, they, uh, they can potentially cause a fish kill. Okay. So, all right. What's the difference between fountains and aeration? Yeah, I think we talked, talked about that, uh, but just to cover it again, you know, fountains, fountains store water up in the air. They create this the beautiful display that you see there. There is some oxygen transfer that occurs, but, um, you know, for the most part, they're pulling water from the surface that already has oxygen that's diffused into it from the atmosphere. So fountains aren't necessarily aren't necessarily great for oxygenation. They're they're uh, they're they're show. They're mostly show. You know, they got they got to pizzazz. Aeration super super boring. It's uh, it's just sitting there chugging away. It's the it's the hard worker making uh, making your pond better, getting oxygen to the bottom, creating that circulation. So uh, that's kind of the the basic. You'll you'll see a lot of uh, Fountain advertisements and different companies uh, promote fountains as aerators, and um, you know I'm not a big fan of that myself. But uh, there can be a little bit of a crossover. But for the most part, 
I'm just think about a fountain is putting on the show and the aerator is uh, charging your pond with oxygen. Right. Okay. Yeah, so electrical demands for a compressor on an aeration system. Yeah, so aeration system is sized based on the lake. And like I said, it's usually a, a compressor sitting on shore and it runs one line to many lines out to different diffusers uh, sitting on the bottom all over. So the systems can be, a, well, my point is the systems can be a lot of different sizes, anywhere from a quarter horse on the small scale up to, uh, you know, three, four horsepower. So obviously the power is gonna, gonna vary a lot with that. Now, I can't tell you from my experience, the typical system, typical one to, you know, 10 acre pond is probably gonna be, you know, somewhere in the, I don't know, five, six, seven amp range. So they don't require much. Uh, you can do them on 120 volt, you can do them on 230. They're pretty, pretty low energy uh, when it comes down to it. So, you know, if you can get a 15 or 20 amp service there, that'll take care of almost any aerator. As opposed to fountains, you know, a decent sized fountain, believe it or not, is uh, five horsepower, <laughs> three, four, five horsepower. So it goes in line, right? Uh, 230 volt, those are, those are using quite a bit more power. A lot more electricity. All right, hope that helps. Do you have any heavy, oh, heavy infestation of water hyacinth? <laughs> and they're removed either mechanically or chemically. What happens to the nutrients? Yeah, that's a great question. We uh, have just consulted with uh, an agricultural site who actually has permission to grow water hyacinth in their ponds to soak up the nutrients in the phosphorus because they take all the water from a, a brewery. Um, and they, they want to suck up the nutrients. They have tractor that all the guy does all day long is rake out water hyacinths from these lakes. And then they, they take it, they pile it up somewhere because uh, you can't transport water hyacinth across the, across the roadways because it's an, uh, class three invasive. So they pile it up there on site. Those nutrients are sucked out of the water, piled up over there. So that's, uh, that's what happens to those nutrients. On the flip side of that, if you kill them in the water, then that's where all the nutrients go. You got all your dead water hyacinths floating there on the surface of the pond, dies, decomposes, goes in. So uh, if, you, if you treat it chemically, then you're going to recycle those nutrients that the water hyacinths pull out of the water right back into it. If you can haul it away, that's a great way. It's a great strategy for, uh, for improving water quality. In fact, there's on a small scale, a much more pleasant scale, you, uh, there's companies that make these, they call them like these floating islands where they put them, all these you know, beautiful plants in them. The roots grow down into the water. <clears throat> they let the plants grow out to their maximum size. And then at the end, I don't know, maybe the end of the season or maybe a couple of times through the year, you pull that island back in, take all the plants out, dispose of those somewhere else. And the idea is you took the nutrients out of the water, grew them into these plants, get rid of the plants, put new small plants in, put the island back out. So kind of the same idea is what you're talking about there with the water hyacinth. Okay. Let's move on a couple more. What are some ways to reduce water turbidity? <clears throat> yeah, so we kind of mentioned the alum. That's a great way to do it. If you use a high enough rate of alum, and here again, I'm gonna be a broken record. It's good if you do water testing where you actually titrate, take a water sample and titrate and see how much alum you need to create what they call a single flocculant. It's like this little puffy uh, coagulated uh, glob, I guess. But it, it just gathers everything. It's like a magnet, you know, like every little piece of speck of soil, dirt, nutrients, everything. And then that thing gets heavier and heavier and heavier and sinks to the bottom. So that <clears throat> is a great way to control your turbidity. Like I said, you can make a pond, and I've seen it happen. You can make it look like a bathtub. Now, that may not last long. You might get one huge rainstorm the next day. It turns everything back up, and it's right back right back into the, in the solution. So that's, that's not always a great solution. Uh, but the other way, you know, an ounce of this support, an ounce of prevention is really worth the pound of cure. So, uh, you know, if you get anything you can do like silt fences uh, to keep uh, bare areas from washing in, if you can catch at the stormwater inlets, if you have drains, you know, like on your streets where the water goes in and drains the lake, they actually make devices that can catch all the leaves and junk that goes into the pond like that. If you can catch everything there, and then... That's a great way to keep that material out of the pond and turbidity down. So those are uh, those are probably a couple of the most common ways to uh, to address that. All right, we want our pond to be swimmable. Is there any level blue green algae that's safe? 
Yeah, blue green scary can be scary stuff. So blue green algae, in the, for the most part, the toxins are toxins are usually within the blue green algae. It's usually not released until it's stressed or or killed off. So for the most part, um, you're gonna you're gonna have some blue green algae in there, and you can find some blue green algae in any pond, in every sample almost certainly. It's really the the level. So you're, I understand what you're driving at. So the answer is you know yes. It's obviously got to be a pretty minimal level, and that and that varies, but um. Yeah, for the most part, you know, you're going to have some, but and, and there are safe levels. But if it looks like it's pea soup green, you're probably well past, well past that point. So it makes, makes me think of kind of a funny story where I was, this has been several years ago, but uh, we're at a meeting and same thing, lakes, pea soup green. They used to have a beautiful clear water pond, you know, and they got pictures from two decades ago where they were swimming in it, buying their house. And, you know, like, hey, we want to get back here. So we've been working with them with uh, these algae treatments and different things. To try to improve improve the water quality, but at one of the meetings, there was a there was a pregnant lady there, and she, she's like, "Oh my gosh, I've been swimming in that pond." And I was just like, "Oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me!" That's you know, that's blue green algae. So, yeah, stay away from them. They're not good, but there are levels. You know, this it's like in Florida, the state we, they do a lot of monitoring. It's in the news all the time about the you know the different blue green algae blooms and different things, and they, and they monitor. You know, and there's a threshold. Once you hit that threshold, then it's like, Whoop, this waterway's closed. No more recreational use for a while. So. So the answer is yes, and it's going to vary. So, all right. Well, so with that, looks like we're just yeah a minute or two past two o'clock. Hey, thanks for the attention. Thanks for the good questions.